You've had a lot of people, and, and, and you have been influenced by a lot of what you have seen, mm -hmm. you know, a, lot of, a lot of what you've read and studied and mm -hmm. all of that. Uh, Terry Gillum gave you some advo advice before you made Reservoir Dogs. Mm -hmm. You remember what it was? Yeah, I sure do. You see movies, and they, uh, they can have, be full of vision, and you, know, you want your movies to be like that. But you, know, you see these other movies that are, don't have any vision, but I'm sure the director tried. So what's the difference between this guy versus that guy? How did he, how was this guy able to get this on the screen and how was this guy not able to get this on the screen? I'm sure if I talked to that guy, he'd tell all these, you know, uh, I'm sure he wanted that. Who knows? And I was afraid of being that guy. <laughs> I want to be that guy. And, um, well, Terry Gilliam definitely has a vision. No two, three, four ways about it. So we were at Sundance and um, it was like a lunch going on at the picnic tables there and everyone else defoed. And uh, it was just me and him talking, which was a thrill. And I go, look, you know, you have a very specific vision in your movies and uh, it's right there on the screen. How do you do that? How do you get that vision that's in your head? How do you get it on the screen? And he said, um, well, Quentin, you have to understand, as a director, you don't have to do that. Your job is to hire talented people who can do that. You hire a cinematographer who can get the kind of quality that you want. You don't have to be able to know how to take the lights and move them around to create an effect. You hire a talented costume designer who can give the colors that you need and the flamboyance or not that you want. Uh, you hire a, a production designer who can do that. Your job is explaining your vision. Your job is articulating to them what you want on the screen. And then all of a sudden, the whole yeah. mystical, shamanistic thing that I thought directing was just went boop, and I realized I could do that. That it wasn't this yeah. Merlin-like magic kit that I needed to know the, the right spell in order to conjure. I, you oh, I can describe what I want. I know what's in my head. <laughs> That's the yeah. easiest yeah. part. I'm good at describing. Is there a series of movies that you want to make? I mean, I've tried to look at sort of what you've done and say, where is he going? Mm -hmm. Now I'm actually kind of getting excited by just that little sentence or your little wrap-up that you just did there, was the fact that um, <laughs> what's he going to do next? Yeah. Um, I think in particular in the case of like finishing Inglorious Bastards and in particular the f right. case of finishing this, who knows what I'm going to do next, but it's actually kind of an exciting question mm -hmm. because there is this, you know, uh, bastard, boom, that was that. Yeah. And now this is this. And it does seem like, okay, there's a box checked, not in some going down a box, but just it's okay. That's, that's, that's his yeah. Western statement. That's yep. his statement on slavery. Right. What's going to be his next genre? What's going to be his next statement? What's going to be the next story that intrigues him to spend a year and a half of his life doing? But you have no idea what it is. Right now, I'm not really and sure. how will you find it? Um... I have to say, I usually find it through other writing. Uh, I've, I've been I mean, doing your writing for something will lead you to thinking, I, I want to go here. Yeah, well, I just, I, I really like doing film writing. And uh, I haven't published any of it yet, but I really like doing film, film. writing. Or, yeah. or these are essays on film, not yeah. criticism. Yeah, it's like, well, it's kind of it's, uh, it's criticism slash essays, usually about right. dead directors, so I don't get in trouble. And I uh, have to. Be sheepish if somebody at a party because yeah. I wrote bad stuff about them. All right, but, yeah. uh, um, and nor, but also it's it's kind of unfair to take a take a, a swipe at a colleague. If I'm a critic, I'm a critic. But if I'm not, yeah. I'm not. Um, but <laughs> I love that type of writing because I love just being this student of cinema all the time and dealing with it and, and constantly putting uh, my aesthetics, what I consider good work versus bad work, uh, constantly under a microscope and then being forced to describe it. But the, what. In, but in this case in particular, it was that writing that led me to this story. Right. And one of the things that was great about it is because I'd been doing so much writing, I wasn't cold when it came time to write this ah. piece. I was lubricated. I was in the zone. I was writing every day. So it was just, you just won't move over to here. Yeah. And that was really exciting. I remember one night on a plane, I've told this story before. <laughs> you remember this? Yeah, I do remember. I, go, I get on the plane. And I, I'm exhausted. I've been working and filming all day in Los Angeles. He's on the plane. It's the overnight red eye. Mm -hmm. And and I get on the plane, as I always do, and probably have a glass of wine and put my head back and go to sleep. Mm -hmm. 
I do that. I look over to you when you're mm -hmm. typing away. Mm -hmm. Then I wake up about 30 minutes before we're going to land, mm -hmm. and I look over there, and you're still doing this. Yeah. <laughs> I said, that Tucker's been up all night creating. Yeah, but you know, one of the, I mean, I... One of the things, to me, the <laughs> greatest thing about an airplane yeah. is I love all that time by yourself. I do too, actually. I just love being in there and no I one's really too. talking to you. Yeah. And then you, you know, I always have books to read and I always yeah. have stuff to write. You know, yeah. and I just, boom, that's like five hours of just straight work. Does this creative power that you have, this creative energy, have an outlet anywhere other than film? Now, you'll argue criticism and I'll take that. But what else? I mean, do you create music? No, I don't create it. Yeah, no. you don't create that. Yeah. No, I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, and you make movies about it. Yes, exactly. And I use it in my movies, and it is a huge part of my aesthetic. It is. It but really is. It's I, a, no, just, it really is. It's, it's and not only. It, yeah, yeah. It's a defining part of your. I, I would agree, but I don't make it, and that's yeah. actually part of you know. So what does that make you a kind of aggregator? Yeah, it's like you know, I guess. Yeah. Well, it also it is it is modern art going on. There is a slightly. Mm -hmm. You know, for lack of a better word, a hip hop aesthetic of taking something that already exists, taking yeah. what you like from what already exists, yeah. and putting it into your own work. And by the way you do it and the way you frame it, uh, creating something that didn't exist before. Yeah. Now, it's taken a while for that to be respected, all right? But that's always kind of where I've been coming from. And how do you use it? What does it add to the film? Uh, well, I mean, personally, I, I just think. Um, it creates you, mood, it creates... Well, it, it's... I just pacing. think... It, I think it's one of the most... I, I try not to... I try not to use music just as a case of pacing. That's how everybody else does it. They put innocuous music just to kind of oh, get the ticking clock going I should on. have been embarrassed to even suggest <laughs> you do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, uh, I think the reason that my music works so good is I don't just blanket it in there. When it is, is in yeah, there, right, it's right, there for right, a real right. purpose. But I, I actually think the right use of of movie image and the right and the connected with the right music is usually the most cinematic moments uh, in the history of cinema uh especially now that we've gotten to the point where we can actually cut to music and uh you know those are the cinematic moments those are the moments that i'm waiting for as the clock's ticking down as i'm watching the movie so is it joy for you putting the movie together in the editing room is that what you like most rather than filming the scenes and making you know, putting it in... I know it's all great. I mean, look, admittedly, uh, editing is far less hysterical. Or, you know, uh, you get up and go to the work. And, it's probably more creative, too, isn't it? it well, it's not, no, it's not, it's not more creative than shooting. Shooting is... Shooting is creative. Shooting is crazy creative, especially the way I do it. All right, but... Uh, what's uh, that? How do you do it? It's, it makes it... Well, I do it, you know, uh, it seems like... You know, I hate to be the oldest guy on the block kind of talk. But I feel, as time has gone on, I feel like the oldest guy on the block, all right? Because it just seems like every time I do a movie, two years later or something, the industry has moved even further away from how I do it, and everyone does it completely different, or the rules on sets and everything are just very, very different from the way I remember them. And it just keeps going like that all the time, even yeah. further and further away. And, um, uh, you know, but one of the things that I do, just um, amongst a, a zillion of them, but one of the things that's a big deal for me, uh, one, I don't use a monitor when I'm making a movie, which seems like everybody has some little video you village. Don't. No. There's no monitor there. No monitor. I mean, there might be a little hand monitor so I can keep track of Are something I'm serious? holding in my hand, you know. But it's something like this, so I'm watching the scene and just kind of glance if I want. No, no. So, so you, 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 it goes right to your mind's eye. Yeah, exactly. I'm just trying to I'll check the framing or something. But the whole deal, though, is... That's not how you do it. What you do is you, I didn't conjure all this up so I would be in another room watching television as my actors are out there yeah, doing yeah. their scene. <laughs> all right, I take the camera, yeah. I frame the damn shot, and I sit right next to the camera. Either yeah. I'm operating the camera, which I didn't do that much on this movie, but I did much more on I thought you'd already made the point that, mm -hmm. that what you discovered about being a great filmmaker is that you could hire these people to do all those things. Yeah, well, no, no, no. Yeah, so you could hire a great cinematographer and done. You know, oh, I, and, cinematography. I, and I do have a great cinematographer, but sometimes I just like to have you the fun. You hire yourself to write it so you well, don't have to worry about the script. Yeah. Well, sometimes I like the fun of actually operating the camera. Sometimes yeah. it's kind of fun. Yeah. All right. Um, Soderbergh used to do that, too. Yeah, oh, no, he does it all the time. That's, yeah. that's his thing. But I like actually, you know, more, it's like the camera's here, the camera's here, the actors are right here, yeah. and I'm right here. 
I'm yeah. right next to the camera, and I'm watching. I'm watching the scene. I can actually even talk to the actors during the scene. I'm saying I do that all the time. But maybe I come up with a line. I throw the line at them. Say that, uh, or maybe I'm their inner voice. Maybe I'm their conscience as they're right. talking about. You know, somebody says something. He looks at them, and I go, "What does that mean? What the hell does that mean?" Yeah. All right. Uh, or he's lying. Don't let him get away with that. Or whatever. I'm not saying that I do that all the time, but if I feel like it, it just comes out and I do it. Um, but also what's important to me, and this is something that has changed a lot as time has gone on, um, it's standard now on most movies and all television shows to at the very least have two cameras operating right. at all times, if not three, if not four, if not five, if not right. six. Right. Um, if not more, uh, but at, le at the very least two. And in that scenario, it's like, okay, you have your main shot right. that you want. And then there's this other camera, and then you're just you're sticking it somewhere, right. all right, where it's not seeing this one, and it's not seeing any right. other equipment. But, you know, it's just, it's, it's a sloppy, it's a sloppy uh, angle, but it's just there to give you a little bit more footage in the editing room, and, you know, so you can just kind of get through your day a little bit easier. Uh, obviously, uh, and now, but now you have to kind of split the lighting as opposed yeah. to just for your shot. Right. I don't want that. I want, I'm framed. I have one camera on the set, and the only shot we're shooting is the shot I'm framing. I frame the shot, and Bob Richardson lights the shot for that frame, and that's it. And I don't want sloppy ass crap, yeah. all right, you know, yeah. in there that I can just cut to. If any f composition you see in my movie was composed by me, and that's what we meant to do that any minute of that day. Any composition I see in a movie of you, of yours, was composed by you. By you, yeah. And there to compose it means what? Means to set the frame. To, okay, just to set the frame. Yeah, yeah that means yeah. to compose it. Yeah, play, yeah, place the camera. How close it is, where you know. Exactly, balance the frame with yeah. anything, make it right. Yeah. Some might suggest, and I'm, this is a question: um, if you could have been Leonardo DiCaprio mm -hmm. and have his acting career, mm -hmm. would you prefer that than the directing career of Quentin Tarantino? No. Way. You know that people don't believe you. Okay, well, it, look, they believe you really want to be an actor. I did a long time ago. Trust me, I've lost that book <laughs> so much I can't even tell you. I can't even tell you how much I lost that book. I had the bug. I got bit. Yeah. It's gone. It's gone. Now, you got bit after you made your first film? or before? Well, no, I always wanted to be an actor when I was earlier on and everything, but I got kind of... Uh, yeah. I, 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 in particular, the, during the time that I went out with Mira, it actually kind of fanned that flame oh, yeah. a little bit. She was this terrific actress and comes from an acting family. I had aspirations in that regard, so it all, like I said, it fanned the flame a little bit. And I got a little carried away with it for a bit. But um, after I did Kill Bill, all that went away. Because uh, if I'm, go I, I've, I've been offered a lot of things in the last 10 years, and I always turned them down. But you do two cameos in this film. Yeah, I do one, one because it was just easy to do. Uh, the other one, I did it basically because uh, we kept moving the scene further, further back, and we kept losing actors because we, it was a scene that we're going to get around to. If I put myself in there and I have to cut it down to nothing, I have no problems with that. All right, if I have Sam Worthington waiting around for six months, I'm going to feel bad if I cut a scene down to nothing. All right, um, but uh, 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 I can cut me, no worries. Um, but the thing about it, though, is um, movies are hard. And if I'm going to be on a set, I want it to be my set. I don't want to be making somebody's dumb movie as an actor. I don't want to have to learn the lines. I don't want to have to sit in the makeup chair. I don't want people faxing schedules to me. I don't care about your dumb movie. I care about my dumb movie. Yes.